Welcome to this special interlude and bonus episode of The Bible in a Year with Manna. Today I'm joined by Pastor Riley. Of course, I'm Uriah Beagle, your traditional host. And we will be covering some topics that we've been discussing and have been coming up as we've been going through the Bible in a year. The two big ones that we're going to be covering are biblical numerology, as well as the presence of God and how he talks to people throughout these times and how that changes going into the desert wanderings. Let's go. So the first one I wanted to bring up is something that was pervasive throughout our reading and will continue to be pervasive is what is numerology and what is biblical numerology? Oh, man. Um, how would I define that? Uh, well, definitely theological concept uh, when it comes to like Bible study, um, how, you know, we as Westerners and just all throughout church history have learned to um, interpret and look for pattern and design from the early biblical authors. Um, what we've discovered um, from Jewish history, um, you know, obviously from, from Israel, from the Hebrew people, that in their writing, they included hints, um, much like we would maybe use emojis when we text or we would type things in all caps or underline, you know how we communicate today. Um, they would hide these messages with numbers. Um, for example, um, obviously we get the seven day week from Genesis, mm. um, but that number seven um, became a code, became a reference for completion. God was done with all of his creative work in those seven days. And so then you'll see the number seven pop up all throughout scripture to communicate completion. Uh, one place I immediately think of, um, do you remember Ruth and her story with Naomi? And the compliment about her was that she was better than seven sons. What they were saying is she's better than a perfect, a complete son. Um, wow. So then, again, that just begins to add weight and gravity to things we read in Scripture as we start to see these numbers and understand their pattern and their reference. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, you mentioned some stuff about seven. Are there any other big numbers? I know people talk about 12. 12, so... Again, you got 12 tribes. Um, Jesus also chose 12 disciples. Um, around God's throne in heaven, there are 24 elders, two sets of 12. Um, and so 12 is a number of governance. Um, a lot of governmental things have that number. I even think about our months of the year. You kind of see the pattern begin to not only impact um, Christians or Jewish people, but it begins to shape the world around these people as they're following God. Um, so 12 is a big number. Eight. Um, eight's a number for new beginnings. So sometimes you'll see in the New Testament, I know it can get confusing, uh, it talks about the first day and the eighth day. And I know you're like, wait, I thought there were seven days in a week. Well, they call Sunday the first day, and they also call Sunday the eighth day because it's a new beginning. You see what I'm saying? Oh. Uh, so just little nuance like that. Three is a big number, um, especially when it comes to repeated numbers. So like seven, then there's seven, seven, seven. So that's yeah. like, they would call that God's number. It's like extreme perfection. Six is the number of man. Man was created on the sixth day. And so when we later, you get to Revelation and you're like, oh, the mark of the beast, six, six, six. It's talking about extreme man and our depravity and our rebellion against God. Mm. Um, so again, just when you begin to see it, you can't help but see it all the time as you're looking for these numbers. And again, we can just keep nerding out because there's so many places. Again, going back to that number 12, um, there's 120 years where God is, again, governmental, judging humanity, saying, I'm going to give you 120 years, and if things don't change, flood's coming. That's what we see in Noah's account. Wow. Um, so a lot's there. And again, like I said, it just kind of adds weight and begins to highlight some things that we might overlook just because we're um, Americans, you know. And where can, is there any any weight we should give to these numbers as we're reading? Uh, are they just contextual clues for us, like you said? Or is there anything deeper that we should focus on in them? Or is there something we should avoid there in our focus on them? Yeah, um, I, I like to live by the principle, um, good things are good things until they become God things. Um, um, I'll, I'll use sex, for example. Um, sex 
is a gift that God created for marriage, one man, one woman, one lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like, good thing. But when sex becomes your God, oh, it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, again, because we're human, because we function this way, we were created to worship, and when we get excited about our favorite sports team or our favorite band or pick something, our, our, we start binging a series that we love on Netflix. Mm -hmm. What we're inadvertently doing is giving that our worship, our adoration, because that's who we are. Um, and so when it, sometimes good intended, like we, we love the Bible, I want to nerd out and I want to decode everything, you can accidentally make an idol out of something that God simply placed there to point you to him. Um, so don't get caught up in the numbers, get caught up in Jesus. And as you study, these are just great little tools to add value to your awareness and your experience with God. So you're saying more of hints and clues, yeah. contextual pieces to add uh, different features to the reading and different discerning tips and Absolutely. tricks in there. Absolutely. Okay. And then as we go into some more tips, there's some ways that we've seen people talk to God yeah. that are just hard to understand in there. So can you give us some tips to understand how were people like Adam was talking to God? Yep. They walked together. And then we have, we've covered figures like Job now. Oh, who yeah. have gotten to have conversations with God, but he also had an intimate friendship with God. Yes. But it was outside of what we'll see later in the tabernacle or in the pillar of fire. So first I just want to, I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to sure, start sure. there with Adam. How did Adam talk to God? Yeah, I mean, we get such a, um, a poetic picture. Um, I think we have to keep that in mind because we read the Bible um, like it's um, any book that you'd grab when you're going through the airport, you need something to read, just grab it. Start reading left to right, keep moving, right? Um, but we have to remember, like, their literary design to Scripture. Um, some of it's poetic. Um, I like to think of the Bible, specifically the Old Testament, as like this big quilt, and there are all these different little patches that are all together. And the biblical authors, as they were inspired by God to weave this tapestry, um, almost had the expectation that, you would zoom out um, and you would see the bigger picture. And so mm. um, I think when we're, when we think about Adam, we have to keep in mind that the way he heard from God is very similar to the way you and I hear from God today. Um, the language of the spirit realm is in your thoughts. Um, and, and so it, it kind of shifts because again, as you first read these stories or uh, maybe you learn them in kids church you're thinking that they're having a open conversation. Um, and maybe that's what that could have looked like. We are talking about a pre-fallen world, so there was no separation between the divine and the created, between mm -hmm. heaven and earth. Um, so there probably was a little bit more intimacy than what we may be familiar with. Um, but at the same time, um, I, I think there's a very valid argument for it being the same, um, that Adam's with God, um, I believe God the Son, whenever God steps into creation, he does it through the, the person of God the Son. And so I think Adam probably had those real moments with Jesus in the garden. Um, some of the language that we see in Genesis talks about how God made man with his hands. Um, and so it just seems that there is something personal. I do think that's also part of what um, the spiritual rebels, the Satan, and the, I think that's what they took offense with that um, God would speak everything else into creation, but then he would make humanity with his hands. Um, wow. So, yeah, again, it just just really communicates how much God really does love us um, before we did anything right or wrong. Like, he just loves people because we're his and he made us. So, um, anyways, I don't know if you want to go, go more into that, but... Well, I think that's an incredible picture of how he's talking to Abraham, or not Abraham, that's the next point I wanted to make, <laughs> how he's talking to Adam yeah. in such an old old manner. Is it's either through that internal thought process, or maybe it is physical, like you were saying. Sure. But once he leaves the garden, you would be definitely saying that it's more towards the God is talking to him the same way we talk to God. Absolutely, yeah. And then moving on to Abraham, the next figure I wanted to cover. Yeah, yeah. 
is he he talks to God, but it's not it's more on the line of how we're talking to God. For sure, sure, sure. Yeah, and we we see some genuine moments there too. Um, I think about the encounter. So again, kind of going back to our numerology conversation, um, on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah, um, there are three visitors who Abraham encounters. Um, and he knows that one of them is God. Um, I mean, he gives his worship. He, he begins to negotiate with this person. And so you right there in this party of three, you're already getting a glimpse at, hey, this this is a little picture of the Trinity. Um, I think the other two members of the party were very clearly the angels that would mm-hmm. go and, you know, implement the judgment for these two cities. Um, but that's also a picture of God's throne. There are always two cherubim that are surrounding his presence, um, mm. which is going to come up later because I know we're going to the desert soon in our reading plan when God gives Moses the blueprints for how to create heaven on earth in this experience of a tabernacle. We need to have this Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's throne, and around his throne are two, two cherubim. Yep. Yeah. Um, so again, just, just neat little stuff like that. Um, but that's a face-to-face encounter Abraham has with God. God wow. steps into his creation yet again. And so I believe this is a, a Christophany. Um, there are theophanies, manifestations of God, and there are Christophanies, manifestation of God, the Son, manifestations of the Christ. And I believe whenever God steps into his creation as a human, he does that as Jesus. Um, so that's what's so cool to me when Jesus makes these statements later in his public ministry, born of a virgin, I am, before Abraham, I am. I'm reading all these moments in Genesis, and I'm like, he's telling the truth. <laughs> you know, wow. it's, it's so good. So anyways. And the next time we see an in-person encounter like that, it's a little confusing for me, is that we get into Jacob, yeah, who is a wrestling match with God, and apparently God's not a good wrestler? <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, that, to me, that's one of my... I, it's been one of the most helpful pictures for me when it comes to understanding God's sovereignty. Um, I would say I'm Calvinist in my theology. Like I, I'm, I know God's sovereign. I know he has a plan and um, he, he's very masterful. And um, one thing I used to um, do when I was active uh, was some combatives. I would do a little Brazilian jujitsu. And I remember my first time rolling with this black belt. Um, he was like 140 pounds um, I'm walking around 220, so I'm 6'3 almost. I'm like, I can take this guy. And he was so masterful in his knowledge that I, I was never in control. Um, and, and so now that picture of God wrestling with Jacob, Jacob thought he was winning, but he never had a chance. Um, and, and so what that black belt was doing to me in those moments, he was putting me in positions to learn Again, he can show me a book on a choke or he can choke me. (laughs) And I'm like, yep, that works. I get it now. I think the same was true for Jacob. And what did God do? He changed his name to Israel, he who wrestles with God, he who contends with God. Mm. So many times in your own walk, don't you wrestle with God over what he's doing in your life and things that feel confusing? And then you wonder, are you God or not? Like, are you big enough to handle this or not? And he gives you that simple adjustment. I'm thinking about, you know, a, um, Jacob's hip getting popped out of place. Um, yeah. And now his walk's a little bit different. Um, but he le- he's learned that he can rely on God to be his protector. Um, so, so, so again, even in that small micro picture, you get the whole gospel, which is what these authors, again, inspired by God, are brilliantly doing in the work of Scripture, man. I think that's an incredible way to phrase it. You said his walk is different after his encounter with God. Come on. What a picture. Yeah, yeah. Now we're going to move on to another character here. We get Moses, Mm. who has a very unique encounter with God. Oh, yeah. And before he's out in the desert, he has this burning bush encounter with God. What's going on there? Why didn't he show up with his angels or... Uh, just talk to him in his head the same way we have encounters. Yeah, yeah. What? Why light a bush on fire to talk to a guy? I mean, he definitely got his attention. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I love about that picture is, you know, the bush wasn't consumed. Um, I think of 
who's it Ezekiel where um you know God touches his tongue with the coal if, if I'm remembering that the right way I know it's one of the prophets so if I'm misremembering that correct me internet I know you will um and, and so often I, I think in my own experience with God is I'm a little afraid to approach him um because when you're in his presence like am I safe like is my soul in the right condition? Like, do I have any sin? Like, because that's going to become a big deal for how God's people experience him mm. while they're in the desert and even moving forward into the temple period for the people of God. And so I, I just look at that picture where he's like, okay, there's fire, but it's not being consumed, which means God is, as C.S. Lewis would put it in the Chronicles of Narnia, talking about Aslan, um, he's not safe but he's good. Um, and I think Moses needed that just where he was, um, having tried to step into leadership and failing when he was in Egypt. Um, and now he's a shepherd, which is a very low class role, especially for an Egyptian citizen like himself. Um, so now he's at this place like, all right, God, I, I thought this was over, but clearly it's not. And so God right there says, Nope, I'm gonna relight this fire. I'm gonna show you who I am. And that is a picture, because fire is going to be a big deal, of heaven touching the earth. Mm. Um, I think of Elijah. Um, obviously, he gets swooped up in a chariot of fire. Um, but one sign that God would consume his offering, fire would come down and consume it. Um, so anyways, like I said, I, I, wow. I love I love all these threads. And again, once you see them, you can't not see them. <laughs> And in what you were saying there, though, God does clearly give him opportunities to correct himself, even as he comes forward impure. Because oh, the yeah. first time he comes forward and he's wearing his shoes, yep. and he says, just take them off, keep walking, let's Come talk. On. Come on. And the second time, somehow his wife knows, oh, no, I got to go circumcise our kid real quick or he's going to die. Yeah, yeah. But well, Her dad was a priest. And But she had quite the warning for that. Oh, I mean, yeah. Otherwise, I could have just struck him dead on the spot. Oh, yeah. He was coming for him. And bolt of lightning, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, or, a, or a heart attack or, w- or whatever, you know. But Dang. God could have just killed him right there. But Absolutely. she had the advanced warning yes. and knew the sin and corrected the sin so that he was not cut off from his people. Come on, come on. Because ultimately in that story, Aaron became the mouthpiece of God. Yes. Even though it was through Moses talking Correct. to him. Yeah, yeah. Some great alliterations there of uh, you will become like God to him Come you, on. because you will be the voice to him to tell him. Yeah. So and so again you're as you as you see the thread, because God speaks, but he often speaks to you through other human beings. Mm. Um, again, we, we're a small groups church, and so we always value uh, being in relationship and in community. But the I think the biggest value of it is you get to hear God's voice. Again, while we're here doing this podcast, you know, maybe you're there listening. You can hear God's voice speaking through other human beings. Um, so don't miss those opportunities. That's what I'm trying to, wow. trying to help people out with. And after Moses has these encounters with God, we move on to some encounters that the entire Israelite people has with God. Oh, yeah. (laughs) They get this pillar of fire and a cloud, a thick, dark cloud, dark enough that it is also used as a wall against the Egyptians. Yes. What are those two things about? That's pretty gnarly, right? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Oh, well, I think about, um, again, we talked about theophany already. Um, there are different spots in Scripture. You look in the Psalms. Um, you look at how God describes himself. He says that I dwell in thick darkness, um, which that's probably not the picture um, that many of us immediately jump to. I think as Christians, especially those who grew up in the church, we immediately associate, oh, darkness is bad. Um, well, no, darkness is something God created. Evil, again, I think we just kind of, put those two words together, evil and darkness, but that's not true. Um, Darkness just means obscure, hidden, um, Mm. words that I think about when I think about God a lot. There are times he's obscure. There are times I don't quite know, and that's part of it. It's like he's unsearchable. He's vast. 
And so we have to get comfortable in that space with God. At the same time, he dwells in unapproachable light, um, mm. which means he does illuminate, he does reveal, and he's patient with us. And so what I see in that picture, um, again, scary for a human being to basically see an, an active volcano leading them through the desert. Um, this thing stands out. It's a lot uh, of fire. I, I know. You, I know you've been on some deployments. I've had that experience. Um, if anyone's been in a desert, you can see for miles. Yeah. Um, so now imagine a pillar of cloud, a volcanic like black ash, all the time when it's day, and then that thing turns to fire at night. All of their enemies can see them walking around for forty years in the desert. <laughs> Like, I don't know if that's what pops up in our mind when we go to that place in Scripture, but that's what the reality was. Um, And so, again, I think God was just giving that clear picture um, that, yes, he's God. He's superior to all the things you were exposed to, all the fallen rebels. Again, there's a whole spiritual pantheon of created beings that want to hijack God's role in the lives of human beings. And he's making it very clear that none of them are like me. Mm. Um, so yeah, a little, little bit of flex on God's part. Um, even though d- during that period, they still made themselves a golden calf mm-hmm. wow. because we like what we can control. Mm. They wanted something they could control. While, while they or? saw that fire and that cloud on the mountain where Moses was, they were like, well, we need to worship something. And these are the gods we met in Egypt. So let's make our own God. Because if I make my own God, I can make the rules. I can please a God that I fashion. Um, but a God who fashions me, I need to learn how to please him. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. From all these, this encounter that they have on the mountain and through this experience with God, it eventually moves into the tabernacle and then temple worship. And yeah. you had mentioned it earlier about building a place for God. Yes. What is the distinction then between what they were doing before and now build him a place for worship? Yeah. Yeah, it's... um. So again, the quilt. The role... Um, again, I was just studying this about Jesus. Um, like thinking of him as the lamb who was slain for all of eternity. Um, and so in the spiritual realm, the deed of the cross was done before God ever created us. Mm. Like, I know, and that's like just wild to process. Um, but I say that to say this is, um, you know how like on your iPhone, whenever um, an app updates something, like Facebook is like notorious for, we've updated our privacy terms. Do you accept them? Um, God consistently modifies the covenant for our benefit. Um, You mentioned the moment he had God talking with Abraham. Well, he asked him to offer this sacrifice, and he was supposed to split this animal and walk down the aisle, almost like a picture of a wedding. Hint, hint. This goes to the numerology. Two people in covenant, they walk down this aisle in agreement, and God tells Abraham, hey, I'll walk down by myself. Um, We worship a God who says, I will keep covenant even when you don't keep covenant. Mm. Um, and so the whole plan, um, where we're going is back to the garden, back to Eden, back to that clean space where heaven and earth overlap heaven on earth. Um, Eden was a high place. And so because of sin in the fall, that was all separated. So God would have these brief heaven and earth encounters with individuals, Adam, Seth, they learned the sacrificial system. They learned how to create or create a clean space where man can experience God. And so now fast forward to what God is downloading on Moses. He's like, hey, I'm going to teach you how to create a clean space where heaven and earth can touch, where you can experience my presence. And this is a glimpse. This is a foreshadow of what I'm going to do when I offer myself as that sacrifice to create, create a clean space. What does his blood do? Covers our sins. And so now we get the person, the Holy Spirit, the person of God in our bodies as the new temple. Like that's where we are today. Um, That's why we don't worship at a temple. That's why we say the church is people and not a building because of what Jesus did to create 
a space where heaven and earth can touch. And ultimately, we're going to see the fullness of that about the things we read in the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's pretty awesome to me how the the covenant changes as people need it to change. So yeah. I, I feel like, for example, Moses going up to get the Ten Commandments was because people kept messing up and they could no longer deal with, oh, God just told me the right things in my heart. Mm. I need a written law. Mm. So, okay. God's like, all right, you need something written out for you? I got you. Come on up here, Moses. Yeah, yeah. Let's get this solved. So good. And it goes up with... Uh, Oh, it goes up to God, and God sends him back down with some instructions. Yeah, that's right. But it's just out of our weakness that we had those things needed for us. Sure. We knew the law before then. Absolutely. And and our weakness isn't bad. Like, I think we just need to own who we are. I mean, there are some of us, you know, some of us listening right now, we're probably more systems-oriented people. We need maybe a little bit more structure. Um, Then there are artists like me where I'm like, hey, man, don't put me in a box. Just let me paint. Um and, and so uh, that's what I love about God is, is he gets us. Like, he really does. And he's like, okay, you need some framework. Oh, you want to know which commandment's the greatest? Again, going to Jesus. He's like, well, let me summarize these for you. Still as restrictive, you know, he then took murder and said, no, hates murder. And he took adultery and said, nope, that's lust. Um, because he wants to help us. He wants us to live and function the way we were designed to. So, Wow. And I think for those of you who are listening, if you go back to our story of Job, if you're really looking for that written in your heart aspect of God's commands, you can look at his rebuttals to some of his friends when he's talking about, these are the things I did Mm. that were good, where he's helping the poor, he's uh, feeding his neighbor when they don't have enough, he's treating his servants well, he's... Uh, being responsible and how he gained his wealth. He's being good to his family, all these various things. And his friends accuse him of some pretty nasty things, and he didn't do those. So it's a good depiction of right and wrong being understood even without right. the commandments and these being followed by a person even before the Ten Commandments and this uh, these massive signs from God to say, I am God. Come on, bro. Because, I mean, before this, the Israelites had some fantastic signs. I don't need, I have no idea how people <laughs> would want to make a calf when they just experienced so much of God's mercy. Ten plagues. Ten oh, pretty horrific plagues. Yeah. And they only had to experience, because we we're not told that they were left out of them, the gnats and the fly. That's the flies and the frogs. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. The other seven are are just, nope, just take out the Egyptians. Mm, mm. And, I mean, the first three would have sucked. That wouldn't have been fun. But after that, God's got you. And it's very clear that you were God's chosen people. So it's just incredible. Absolutely. And I feel like today we make those same mistakes where we have God in our lives and we still can choose to do wrong mm. even though God is here with us he is dwelling in us yeah we have advantages that these people didn't have that's we right. have the holy spirit that's right in us they didn't have that when that's they right. chose these wrong things mm-hmm. and we still choose to do wrong even with this miraculous presence of god is protection from God. That's right, yeah. Because yeah. that's his hand in your heart. Oh, yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah, this is this is when you start to worship, you know, like when you really ponder these things. Like, he's, he's good to us, man. Yeah. Now, that's, that's essentially all I had for today. I mean, that's what I wanted to talk about. Was that's there good. anything you wanted to leave as a parting thought of, God's grace and God's dwelling with us as we continue in our journey? Oh, man. Kind of got me wondering. Um, I don't know. I mean, I just felt like you you wrapped it up pretty pretty eloquently there. And um, I guess if I can piggyback off that, um, I would just tell people to value his presence over performance. Mm. Um, you know, one thing I've been studying lately that um, – God's people did during this time as they're getting ready to figure out how to live with God in this desert so we can go into the promised land. That's the goal. 
Um, let's learn to be citizens of this new kingdom that's coming. Um, the high priest carried these two stones, um, Urim and Thummim, and um, you know we kind of hinted at this with the numerology. Um, you don't want to get in the divination; like the the Bible's really clear on um, witchcraft, and, mm -hmm. um, and and so they had a way to basically flip a coin uh, to discern the will of God, um, and, and God would use it; like He would speak to them through these two stones. Um, but then there were moments where even the ephod, even the priestly garments, even Urim and Thurim, again, they're lost to history now. Um, at some point, human beings started to rely on the instruments more than they relied on the presence of God. Mm. Um, and so that's my hope for, for all of our listeners. Um, as you're reading the Bible, as you're uh, growing in your relationship with God, don't fall in love with the things over the person who created them. Um, Wow. Just stay tethered to him, man. Stay close to the presence. Wow. What a great note to wrap it up on. Hey, thank you for listening with us today. We look forward to seeing you back in the Bible in a year. And thank you again for joining us on this interlude.